Let's pray. May your written word be our guide, your Holy Spirit our teacher, and your glory our supreme concern. concern. Amen. In the Gospel of John today, Jesus returns to the home of Lazarus. And Mary and Martha have, are having a dinner party for him. And it must have been a place where he felt at home, where he could relax. And it's the night before he enters Jerusalem on a donkey, where many people will be throwing palms and, and clothes before him on the road to Jerusalem. And at the dinner party, it's Mary who is serving, of course, and it's Lazarus also there who is reclining at the table, but he is quiet. And I read of one interpreter who wishes that someone could have interviewed Lazarus. I do too, as a matter of fact. What questions would you have asked Lazarus? What's it like to be dead? Did you see your family? Did you see any bright lights? Did you hear a voice saying, not yet, you can go back, you know, to your family? Um, but we don't hear anything from Lazarus. And Mary, Mary was there too, as usual, and she wasn't helping her sister Martha. And so what do you think was going through Martha, mother through Mary's mind? And maybe, maybe she was wondering, who was this man who they invited to their home, who had resuscitated, revived, Lazarus, her brother, and maybe she was just overwhelmed with gratefulness um, before him um, because she was the one who ran up to him and said, earlier, Jesus, if you had not been here earlier, uh, my brother would not have died. And then Jesus had ordered the stone to be rolled back, and he cried out with a, lar a loud voice, Lazarus, come out, and the dead man came out. And these were all recent memories before this dinner party and maybe entering her mind as she looked at him. And then, as we said in the children's sermon, and then at the dinner party, it's Mary who comes over to Jesus, opening this very precious, expensive perfume. And she comes before him uh, and maybe unpins her hair and allows it to fall on her shoulders and all of the men must have gasped at this behavior, and her sister, Martha, must have gasped at this behavior because this is not done by respectable women. But Mary is not really concerned about social etiquette, nor how much this perfume cost. And so she takes this, a portion of this, and she pours it on Jesus' feet, and then wipes it with her hair. <laughs> And Judas, Judas can't understand all of this, so he protests. Jesus, you don't know what, don't you know what you're, uh, what you're doing with this money? It could be used for taking care of the poor. It's a really good observation. And Jesus responds by telling Judas to leave Mary alone. And it's, it's something strange and mysterious. Mary is anticipating and honoring the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you won't have the poor with me. And someone said, the heart of Christianity is not meeting people's needs. The heart of Christianity is Jesus. And so it's a real complicated story, not the least because it raises some really thorny questions about poverty, devotion, generosity, and stewardship, but because it's also a rich story full of treasures that might be able to carry us to Palm Sunday, to Jerusalem with Jesus. There's a Cuban-American theologian named Justo Gonzalez who wrote an essay entitled, Judas is Right! And Gonzalez says, Judas is even more pragmatic than Martha. Judas criticizes Mary's action as an unnecessary waste of what it could have been put to better use for the poor. And Gonzalez thinks that the church would like to be like Mary, but is often more like Martha and Judas. In the church, we look for responsible budgets, strategic visions, and best possible use of every cent and that seems like the right thing to do, doesn't it? <laughs> but he wonders if church's stewardship could be better founded on overwhelming love 
rather than efficiency and metrics. So in some Bible meditations, like the Ignatius Spiritual Exercises, they say, or they invite participants to imagine themselves to be actually in the Bible stories, to be a character in the story, or to be a fly on the wall, and to pay attention or to imagine what is actually happening in the story. So, the question for you is, if you were at this dinner party, where would you place yourself? Would you prefer to sit next to Mary, or would you prefer next to sit next to Judas in this scene? As you know, a group of us are studying C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters, and there's a book cons consisting of 31 letters written by screw tape, a senior devil to a junior devil named Wor Wormwood, giving him instructions. And so the goal, the goal of screw tape is to undermine God's word and promote abandonment of God through temptations. And he does this by luring, seducing the patient, the patient, which is all of us reading, to become totally self-focused in our life so that the universe revolves around me. So the letters, as I look at this and I read them over again, and I just realize this, they're a variation on St. Augustine and Martin Luther's understanding of sin. And their understanding is kind of put together in a very neat Latin phrase called, called incurvatus in se. Incurvatus in se, which means a human heart curved in on itself. So Screwtape's constant message throughout all of those letters are um, to keep the patient's mind, our minds, endlessly revolving around ourselves and only ourselves and only our programs and agendas in our life. So just last week we had a discussion on one of the chapters where we learned how Screwtape, um, the top, um, had the top goal to make the church a party church. Interesting. Not a church of celebrations, but a factional church. Um, and Screwtape says, um, composed, of, composed of factions and tribes. And Screwtape writes, I think I warned you before if you are a patient um, who, uh, if, you, if your patient can't be kept out of church, he ought to be violently attached to some faction within it. And so screw tape goes on to say, the real fun is working up hatred between those factions in the church. A factional church? A program church? What's that? What do you think that is? I think I know what it is. I know what it is. It's a church focused on a particular political party, right, left, zealot, Sadducee, Pharisee, Republican, Democrat. A church focused, adamantly, unyieldingly focused on a particular identity issue, like LGBTQIA 2A plus, 2A plus, critical theory, critical race theory, or being a reconciled in Christ church, or a church who identifies itself by standing against these progressive issues and defines itself by standing against progressive issues. So, Screwtape has this in his heart firmly against a church where people are free to put forward questions, ask, I, put forward ideas, ask questions, make mistakes, have their ideas strengthened or changed by tough questions, and where there is any attempt to bridge the divisions in society, or any attempt to bridge the differences in injustices in society. Again, Screw Tape says the real fun is working up hatred between groups. And it seems like Screw Tape is having a heyday today in our society. We're picking apart, piling on, putting down, and the name is the name of the game. And I wonder, I wonder 
if this is a form of Judas behavior, which says to Jesus, I will follow you if you do this for me. But if you don't do this, I might just cash you in for 30 pieces of silver. And then there's Mary. A Mary who doesn't seem to have any agendas or programs. Doesn't seem to be part of a tribe. Well, maybe she did have an agenda for Jesus. And that was to heal her brother. And then she saw Jesus raise her brother from the dead after he had been in the grave for three days. And maybe, maybe something happened to Mary when she saw this. You know, it's interesting that in English the word for gratitude is derived from the Latin gratia, which means grace. And the word graciousness and gratefulness and gratitude all seem to have to do something with grace. And now at this dinner party, all that is left is Mary's gratitude. So all she can do is pour perfume on Jesus' feet. Well, that's the dinner party. And there are two different views of Jesus, the Savior. One of them, Judas, the critic, always complaining, and there's other of Mary, who seems to be overwhelmed by both by grace and gratitude. So where do you belong in the scene? Where do I belong as we walk with, with Jesus to Jerusalem this week? Um, for some reason, uh, when I was writing this sermon, there was a, um, um, a scene that came back to my mind again and again. It took place in our my first parish, which was in Shiloh, Ohio. And Shiloh was a town of 900 people, and there were 300 people who were members of the church where I was at. And one of our favorite couples there was an elderly couple, and their names was Ruth and Rudy. And they were both 80 years old at the time. And Krista and I loved and respected them so much that we asked them to be the godparents of our firstborn son. Well, on this a particular occasion, they asked me to drive a couple of hours to the Cleveland Clinic. Um, Rudy had a heart problem. He was supposed to have a bypass early on Friday morning. So we got up early in the morning and got him there at 7 a.m. And, um, and he was prepared for having surgery at 9 o'clock. And then what happened, the nurse came in before 9 o'clock and said that there's an, been an emergency and someone is needed um, um, and someone in the doctor is needed for this particular surgery at this time slot. So your time for surgery has been moved to 11 a.m. And so at 11 a.m., near 11 a.m., another nurse came in and said, there's been another emergency, so your time has come to, um, for surgery at 1 a.m. And you could see Ruth and Rudy becoming a little, little uncomfortable there. And then this happened at 1 o'clock, and then at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, surgery was postponed. And finally, the physician came in to see Ruth and Rudy and said, I'm so sorry, we're not able to do surgery for you today. Could you please come back on Monday morning? Hey, you know, I was mad then. And I said, what do you mean it's been postponed? They made a long trip to come here. But then it was Rudy who interrupted me, and he said, oh, uh, Pastor Wayne, that's okay. Someone else needed that surgery much more than I did. You know, um, the Lord has given me a beautiful life, my lovely wife, Ruth, and our children, and I have been overwhelmed with blessings in this life, and I'm ever so grateful, you know? it won't be a problem for you to drive me back on Monday morning. <laughs> there was a, a professor from Lafayette College who said, to speak gratitude is courteous and pleasant, to enact gratitude is generous and noble, but to live gratitude is to touch heaven. And we don't know exactly what motivated Mary to buy this really expensive perfume, to pour it on his feet, Jesus' feet, and to wipe 
his feet with her hair. But maybe she did touch heaven that evening. Amen. Thank you.